This is Jackie and I am here with Trenton of Hands Like Houses. We are in a very chilly Baltimore soundstage, but we're hanging tough. It could, yeah, it could be worse. worse. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we last spoke on the red carpet, 2017 APMAs. Right. A very uh, frenetic, kind of like busy situation. This is way more laid back. Oh yeah. I'm definitely more okay with this amount of people around. <laughs> a, lot, a lot less yelling. That was a very crazy night. What do, you th what do you think is like the biggest thing or event that has happened for Hands Like Houses since we last spoke? I can think of a couple of things, but what comes to mind for you? Um, I think obviously the WWE Super Showdown theme with Monster was probably one of the biggest, coolest things to have happened since. Um, the rest I've just got to think. Like, I'll say that as my answer, but I kind of everything kind of blows together a bit, so it's hard to remember what happens when. <laughs> I can only imagine. So how did you kind of link up with WWE? Um... To be honest, actually, uh, Josh, uh, one of the guys at Hopeless Records, um, his whole job is just basically servicing, like, streaming, playlists, radio, um, just promotional opportunities. And um, he happened to know the new music director at WWE and put it across his desk, and it was the first song that this new music director picked, and he apparently it's the fastest they've ever chosen a song. So uh, it was pretty exciting for us. We got an email. We, was, we were just waking up in Australia at that point because time zone differences, and... Um, said hey guys just uh need to approve this if you're cool with it uh first use is in like four or five hours i was like whoa uh, yeah sure why not we didn't really know what we were signing up for even um but yeah we said look obviously you know something cool and then we just as we kind of started seeing the ads go through and the number of people like tagging us on twitter and instagram and everything and then um and then just seeing the event like how big of a deal it actually was it kind of all sunk in kind of over over the next few weeks of just like wow crap this is a huge opportunity so yeah. WWE is huge. It's definitely international. Are you a wrestling fan? And do you have like a favorite wrestler, or are you just like you tune in and you enter? You're like, I want to hear my song played on TV, and I want to see what they do with it, and it's amazing. I have to say, not really a wrestling fan. That's not to say that I don't appreciate it or respect what it is, like because it's obviously built a huge. I watched the TV show Glow, and I think it's given me more of an appreciation for. I think just, I mean, you know, obviously it's a fictional narrative of just the way people are behind it but I think it made you appreciate kind of what goes into it a bit more and um, I think just seeing the scale and size of it like it is an entertainment product like it's not a sport and I think for me that's the biggest kind of I guess hesitation for me is like I'm very much a sport guy um, but I think just once I separate from that I can definitely appreciate it. and obviously when they've built up such a massive fan base of just the machine that it is it's pretty wild to kind of look in from the outside and just see the way that even just us having a song involved with it, just the connections that made for us just kind of blows my mind as to how big the whole thing actually is. No, I am definitely, I, I'm not a fan that I tune in all the time, but I know that most wrestlers have like a finishing move. Mm -hmm. What would your like finisher be or what would it be called? What would it involve? Would it just be like a drop the mic kind of moment? Oh. Would someone come in and like take care of business for you? I, I see. I would. Mine would be the Jacks attack because that's okay. relative with my name, and it would just be something where like I throw an elbow and I walk away, and then, like they fall down a couple of seconds later, okay. like a delayed reaction. Because you, they, WWE loves the drama, from yeah. what I from what I understand. I don't know. Uh, finishing move. Weirdly enough, um, this is probably a darker sort of answer, but my mind's going back to when I was bullied at school. Uh, if people tackled me, I'd always get them in a headlock and just drop backwards and smack their head into the ground because it was the only kind of thing I had before someone else was grabbing me and pulling me off them before yeah, yeah. I could swing a punch. So I feel like that would, you know, maybe that, that's a little bit of a darker, more serious answer than I think I was really, maybe you were aiming for. But uh, yeah, that was just my only way to kind of get one good hit in was that when they tackle me, just smack the head into the ground as hard as I can. And then, uh, then by that point, I'm usually getting dragged up and thrown out of the way so that I can't swing a punch. Because. We'll call it Trenton's Revenge. All right. That's your, there's your finisher. So uh, well, there's a lot more not just WWE that's gone on for Hands Like Houses uh, since we last spoke. Uh, in October, you released your fourth studio album, Anon. How is it in evolution since, like, Groundsweller? Uh, significantly. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, f from album one to album four, um, we've always tried to kind of take, uh, like, my I guess my motto for, you know, producing different albums has been the best way to create the impression of a step forward is to create a step to take a step to the side first and I think for us that's always been we've always tried to make a different album each time so that we're not trying to recreate the same thing because then it's always going to be better or worse you know what I mean like there's only two ways about it but if you create something different then it's its own thing it's can you know I don't believe we have a best album we've made it's just that we've made four great albums each 
that we feel really confident in at its moment in time. And yeah, I'm proud of everything we've done. So it's the same with a non, like, you know, a non's different to dissonance. Dissonance is different to unimagined. And yeah, just by, you know, there's always like one step at a time. And I think that that's been the big thing. Like you look at bands like Thrice and Bring the Horizon that have progressed quite significantly over their careers. It's only by taking those one, sure, it might be a big step, but it's still only one step at a time. And there's pieces of the album before and the album after it in each, in each step. And it kind of makes sense as part of a journey rather than just immediate point of comparison. I don't know. That's the way I like to think about it. I like that. I like that. Uh, so with new music comes a focus on the charts. Uh, would you rather have like tangible album sales, air, uh, radio airplay, or streaming, or a combination of kind of that mesh? Yeah. Honestly, it, it is just the way that it all plays in. Because, I mean, I was having a chat last night. We um, actually bumped into the guys from Memphis May Fire. Um, just happened to be in the same car park as them. Um, <laughs> just outside of New York City last night. We are talking with Jake about like first week numbers and how that streaming has kind of distorted the way that first week sales are reported because it doesn't necessarily line up to the same amount even though the money might be the same on the back end in terms of royalties and stuff you know it's in terms of like chart positions it's like you're competing with a very large casual user base who just put on whatever's popular and the biggest playlists and so those those get massively blown up so it becomes the smaller charts that become more important but at, at the end of the day like I don't really care as long as people are listening to our music and turning up to shows and buying merch and kind of supporting us in what we do, then that's more significant for me than any particular number on a chart because the charts just, you know, it, it's all smaller charts and sub charts and, you know, it's not always necessarily made up by how many people are actually listening to the song at a given moment. It's just, you know, it's indica indicative of that week, you know. We got number, I think it was number four, no, number three, three or four in Australia with first week with streaming and stuff behind some pretty significant artists but you know what I mean if we'd released it two weeks earlier there was no big releases coming out so we might have been number one like it, it's it's just you know it doesn't mean much in terms of our gauge of our success for us at the end of the day we're playing on the other side of the planet from home and there's you know hundreds of people here every night and singing along to every song we play whether it's from you know this album the last album or the one before like everyone's just belting out the same enthusiasm so that for us is more significant and I think just, you know, the fact that we still have more opportunities coming, that's always the biggest measure of, you know, success for us is just what's next, what's coming. What role does music streaming have in 2018 in music for you guys? Um, I mean, it's a big deal because um, that's, you know, it's, it's an income stream that wasn't there through, I guess, the early part of our career with piracy and stuff being rampant. And, you know, I think streaming's got a long way to go before it becomes the answer to, you know, I guess, digital media. Um, I think it can be monetized more effectively but, you know, like, like I said about the streaming numbers, like the massive artists are the ones that the free users tend to listen to more. And I think that the way that streaming services use their free tier um, dramatically distorts the, the numbers for bands like us that are kind of generate a lot of streams. Like we're talking, you know, millions and millions of streams, but that doesn't necessarily translate to the back end of it. So it's kind of, I would love to see a world where we don't, you know, there isn't a free option aside from, you know, your service, particular singles, for example, promotionally or something like that. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's any, like, if it wasn't for streaming, the only income streams a band would have would be show tickets and merch and that's it. And, you know, it, 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 you know, everything else we do is all about just putting ourselves out into the world in the hope that someone likes it enough to kind of carry on to these other things and obviously end up here, you know, at a show singing them along with us. And for us, that's the most rewarding part. But I think, you know, in terms of trying to build a career, I think there's a lot of shifts that still can happen. I mean, hell, I'm working on an app myself with a couple of friends, just the concept stage at the moment, but building it up into something that is, you know, intuitive for both fans and bands to kind of interact directly in a way that's like mutually valuable. And, you know, um, uh, you know, that's what I'd love to see happen. But at the end of the day, like it's always going to move somewhere and hopefully that's going to be a positive thing. The Music Modernization Act just happened and still don't exactly know how that's going to translate until we see our royalty checks in a couple of years, like well, in a year or two once it's fully like enacted and um, filters through all the systems. Like there's always a you know period of time after those things to kind of see what happens. But um, yeah, you know, I think it'll all go in the right direction eventually. So, Speaking of fans and, and performances, how do you go about choosing a set list now with... Uh, four albums under your belt honestly our uh our spotify like insights and analytics because um we found that spotify f at least for us as you know the band um the analytics at platform that they have is so in-depth that we can kind of see well, what streams are the most i mean i'd love to see it broken down per city per country etc right. but at the moment we can still see what the most popular songs are and that kind of helps us develop our set list but you know we kind of take the main singles any 
you know, Dark Horse sort of popular ones like Division Symbols, for example, is still one of our highest streaming songs, um, partly because of the playlist it's on, but that one there is like a big deal f- for us, so we include that in there. Um, and then we just throw in a couple of songs that we want to play just for ourselves, and, you know, the, the off, quite often those are kind of the more, you know, the deeper cuts, but at the end of the day, those ones have a different opportunity to kind of connect with fans, especially when, you know, fans feel like, oh, well, you know, I didn't expect them to play this song. This is sick, you know? So, yeah. So we're finally getting to the end of 2018. I think a lot of us are like... That went quick. Final, like, it went quick, but we're also like, finally. Because yeah. I know at least here in the States, it's been a rough 2018. And a lot of folks turn to music either to distract themselves or to escape from things. And um, what music do you find yourself turning to if you've had a rough day? Um... To be honest, I don't listen to as much music as I probably should, um, because I'm always kind of working around music. I like it's it's gen- tends to be more what I'm surrounded by. But I think I like throwing on things just when I feel like just switching off and putting some music on. I tend to put on, you know, usually more aggressive sort of stuff. Like I like listening to stuff like Norma Jean and Converge and Parkway Drive and um, you know a few th- sort of things in that sort of vein. And just I don't know that I think I find like stuff that's a bit more intricate and a bit more like powerful. I think I like to listen to that, but you know what I mean? There's times I've listened to just more like, I guess ambient sort of things like me without using a record or listening to that a lot. Thrice's new one. Um, and, and then I tend to listen a lot. To, I work, I have my own studio at home and I've got a bunch of demos at the moment. I'm sitting on for um, a couple of different bands I've been working with and one band in, this, in particular from my hometown in Newcastle. I'm doing some work with them, a band called Introvert, and just been kind of listening over their demos and trying to figure out how to kind of restructure them and make them the best they can be. I mean, they're great songs to start with, so that's really exciting for me. So I tend to listen to that probably as much as finished songs that are already out in the world by other bands, yeah. I think certainly like heavier music brings about like a cathartic kind of response. When I talked to Maddie, in fact, last week when they played here, he was like, I don't really listen to music. I listen to podcasts. I'm like, that's not a bad option either. I mean, it's, it's, it's giving yourself some variety. Um, 2019 is like just on the horizon. Can you make a prediction or things that you know are coming up for Hands Like Houses in 2019? Yeah, we just announced uh, Sonic Temple Festival, which is mental lineup, like crazy big. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> The thing that scares me is we are going to be doing shows kind of linking up a couple of festivals, but I don't know if that means we're going to be in Columbus for all three days, so I'm really nervous that all the bands I want to see are going to be the other days, because there's a solid list. I'm, I'm sure I'll see a couple of the ones I want to see, but it's I, I think there's probably about 10, 11, 12 bands that I really would like to see, and I'm... Yeah statistically probably going to see one in three. Foo Fighters, I think, is the one that I want to see the most just because I've never seen them play before. But, you know, they don't come to Australia too often and when they have, I've been away on tour or, I've, you know, I was actually working a festival that they were on and, didn't, you know, was busy driving other bands around at the time. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's such a good lineup. There's so many bands. It's just, I just really hope we get to stick around for at least one extra day. Well, I hope we get to talk to you again there. So stay tuned for much more from Hands Like Houses. This is Jackie. Thanks to Substream Magazine.